So, Bill, um, before we started rolling on this interview, you were you were we were talking about the fact that you have a, a film in pre-production, and th that dovetails nicely into the first question I wanted to ask you, which is, what are the thrills that you get as a theater producer that are different from the excitement or the thrills you get from working in film? Um, the 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 bulk of my film work has been in animation and. Um, when when people ask me like the differences between animation and theater, I generally start with what's the same about both of them. And the pro the process of actually developing the projects are very, very similar, even if like the the actual organization and types of people, but they're highly collaborative art forms. They take years and years and years to make. Um, the kind of like creative data comes in and out of whether it's readings and workshops and out of towns and then eventually previews um, on the animation side it's like script and storyboard and screenings and brainstorm like they so they have a very like you know managed chaos kind of you know creative process which is quite uh quite amazing and a part a part of it that i really flourish and i love i love that part of it like that uh, that that the best idea wins and that good ideas can come from anywhere and that the design serves the storytelling as much as the performances do. And then so all that's the same. Then when it comes to make it, they couldn't be more different. And I think that's where like the thrill of live theater is like you can talk about and think about and consider all the stuff in the world you want to do. But like at seven o'clock, the actors are going to come in, they have to warm up and they're going to go on stage. And so that whole process of getting to like making the show, there is like a real finality to it and an urgency to it. Cause you're in the room with like human beings who are just like, have to go on the show, go on that night. Um, animation then is a very thoughtful frame by frame process that takes a long time. So um, I guess the thrill in both of them is seeing the germ of something, the tiny little morsel that you start with, like, hey, let's make, you know, a show about this girl who gets denied, you know, the ability to go to her prom, or let's make a show called Moulin Rouge inspired by Baz's film, or let's make this animated film, you know, seeing that little morsel from the beginning and nurturing it and nurturing it, like the thrill of that is, is the same in both. It's like, wow, how, five years ago, we said we we're going to do this. And it's, amazing and it's completely different and it's actually what i dreamed of in both ways like and, and so that that's what's exciting about it well you mentioned that your whatever that morsel is of the, uh, that that initially piqued your interest what was the morsel in the prom that that <laughs> made you say not just that this was a good story but this was the right time for the story yeah i mean you know for me the the people are also a really big part of it and so the opportunity to do something with casey nicola who i've known i had known at the time my my producing partner dory berenstein and then jack lane as well but dory and i both knew casey for a very long time like i was kicking around as an actor in new york when casey was in the chorus of shows so we were like oh we should do something together and then he came to us and said oh i heard this amazing idea from Jack Vertel, and it was really a one sentence idea, which was, wouldn't it be funny if, and that was kind of like the foundational idea of the prom, which was a bunch of kind of uh, somewhat self-serving grand Broadway stars think they're going to use their celebrity to help this girl get her prom back on. I love the, I love stories about outsiders. I always have loved stories about outsiders. And the great thing about the prom is that there's two sets of outsiders there's a girl at the center of the story and her girlfriend and they're kind of outsiders in their community. And they ultimately, I think, help to help to begin a change within that community. And then there's the outsiders, the New York brash people who think they know everything, the liberal New Yorkers coming to this small town to teach them a lesson. And yet, of course, they learn something when they get there. And so I, I love that juxtaposition. And I love stories where not everyone's right and not everyone's wrong, you know, like the villains aren't clear and the heroes have flaws. And I think that was what I loved about the prom. The why now of it was, you know, at the time, interestingly, we were, we had our very first workshop of the prom just as marriage equality passed. Um, and I remember people saying to us like, oh, well, this, this idea is old and isn't really timely anymore. Um, and and I remember thinking, oh, that's such an interesting thing, because maybe in and at that moment in New York, it felt that way. 
Um, but I, I do think there's always stories about uh, stories about people who feel othered or feel like they're on the other side of a discussion. There's an evergreen factor to them. Um, it, the players may change, but that feeling I think is pretty universal. Um, and I think ultimately a story that's about you know, kind of like the more we actually talk to each other and the more we find the middle ground really have is timely and and is evergreen as well. But like I I think it promotes a conversation versus a fight. Well, it's interesting because also people love underdog stories and Emma's journey is one of an underdog, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And it's it's and, be, and because it's such a personal story, again, you know, there's a universal thing like we all want to it's we all wanted to or or hoped to or went to that first dance, you know, like, you know, we all have that's a universal connection. We all have it's like, oh, you want to either ask somebody and have them say yes, or you want to be asked to that first dance. Um, and so that kind of rite of passage is pretty universal for everyone. Um, and and I think that's what like makes it such a sticky and great and ultimately super, super funny and heartfelt story. I've spoken to people who've been involved in the Broadway tours of Tootsie and also Pretty Woman. Mm -hmm. And in both cases, they said they made some substantial changes in the show before taking it on the road. Has the prom undergone any changes since it was performed in New York? No, you know, um, a, a few lines here or there, but actually, no, it's actually um, it's actually maintained what it was. Um, and then there was the film version, which, you know, a lot of people now their first experience of the prom was through the film. But um, we didn't we didn't like enhance the show with any of the ingredients that were new to the movie. Um, so, no, we didn't make a ton of changes. We didn't we didn't actually feel like we needed to. We actually went, oh, we were going to make a bunch of changes. We sat down and went through it all. And we're like, you know, it all really does stand. It does stand on its own two feet. Um, you know, we we did change. There used to be a reference to Stephen Sondheim in the script that uh, felt like not appropriate, you know, after he passed. And so that was one thing that changed. But um, other than that, it's all exactly what it was. Well, after you make a reference to Stephen Sondheim, who comes in second and replaces him? Well, there, there, uh, there's an, another giant that's referred to now. So, you know, a, a equal, but a giant. Yeah. So somebody who probably shared the same birthday? Potentially, potentially. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> um, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people with whom I speak mention how powerful the New York Times is. And if you get a bad review, that, that the paper has entirely too much power and it can completely sink a show. The prom was a critic's pick, yet the good review, the rave from the New York Times wasn't enough to keep it running on Broadway. Why do you think that dichotomy exists? Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I have any like, you know, thing. I mean, obviously getting a great review from the Times is helpful. And it was, you know, certainly we the the prom you know in some ways I think about it like we I love the prom I love our show and it's a show that I would love to have seen you know when I would just be some an audience member um and it has absolute rabid fans who love it love it love it and there's an audience for it um I think that expanding that to a much broader group of people who are going to like get over like what the what the entry line is, you know, like even like it's about a lesbian, like that in itself actually maybe limits your audience right there. Like some people think it's not for them. What I have found over time is that people who come to it go, oh, I had no idea it was going to be this. And and actually uh, they, they really love it and gravitate towards it. You know, the economics of Broadway and keeping the Broadway shows running and who comes and all that, it's such like a, a machine in a way and there is just a limited group of tourists and there's things that they know are going to be great and then they have x number of slots available to see things that they that they might might take a chance on and uh, i'm really proud of the run that we had in new york you know we opened we were talking about an underdog story i mean we could not have been a bigger underdog in that season in every way and yet we were part of the conversation 
for the Tonys and we won the drama desk and we got a lot of nominations. And I think a lot of people didn't expect that of our little show. And so we feel really proud of the accomplishment of it. You know, it's just, you know, we didn't come in with like the heat of an out of town. We didn't get, you know, there, we didn't come in with a big title. We didn't come in with a, a movie title behind our name. You know, I was working on the prom and Moulin Rouge at the same time. And they were very, they both were really challenging for totally different reasons, but they had different dynamics around them being one being totally original and one being something that everyone thought should be on stage. So there's definitely, you know, that, in, that aspect of it. You know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, you, you talked about, about not having a pre-sold concept, which you do in Moulin Rouge and in the prom that you don't, it seems as though Broadway is becoming more and more about pre-sold concepts and that the original ideas get less attention. Ironically, we're talking about this this just months after a strange loop wins the Tony Award. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as a producer, how do you figure out what you think has the best chance of working? And when do you roll the dice on something that isn't a known entity? Um, you know, I, you know, I I feel in a way you're right. I feel you're you're right to say that in some ways what's happened with Broadway. And there's a million reasons for it. And I think the pandemic has then accelerated that even more greatly. It's similar to what happened a little bit in the movie business, especially the theatrical movie business. You know, there there was a time when there were movies that were made for 20 and 30 and 40 million dollars that like had stars in them, but they were dramas and they had a limited audience, but they were still very successful films. Now you have like either big, giant event branded things or and, and family still works very, very well. Or you have like tiny little things that come through Sundance or Toronto that are indie and then become, you know, Oscar contenders. And I kind of feel the theater has become that as well. There's the big giant, you know, either jukebox or movie title stuff that's like big, 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 big. Um, this year, again, was a great example of like, it was MJ versus a strange loop, you know, both beautiful, amazing, well-crafted, completely artistic shows in totally different ways. But it was like the big giant Michael Jackson show and this, you know, this thing that came, you know, from this person and was off Broadway and came in. We see that all the, I feel like we see that narrative all the time. It's something rotten versus fun home. Next year, it'll be Kimberly Akimbo versus whatever the thing is, you know, like, so I, uh, for me, my my I have to care about a show and love it. You know, I don't I don't work on a ton of things. My my personal strategy is I call it the Fabergé egg strategy. It's like if we work on this thing and we put all of our love and heart and soul into it, maybe someone will want it when we're done with it. But at least we'll all have had this incredible time together working on it. Um, and I put the same kind of love and care into the prom as we did into Moulin Rouge, as I do into my animated movies. Because it it takes so long and it's so hard and there are, you nobody knows what works. You know, how many things that were pre-sold and had a great title and everyone thought it was going to be the biggest hit didn't work at all. Shows that you know the title of come with expectations and sometimes surpassing someone's expectations and overcoming expectations is really, really challenging. Um, so shows that come with nothing, like no expectation, you can surprise and delight people if you can then break into the mainstream. And there's many of those who are running on Broadway right now, you know? So I, I, I pick things that I love and believe in. And also because the people, I love working with the people who are involved. And hopefully I kind of try to think like, I'm going to build this thing. And if we get it really, really right, people will want it when we get there. Like, I can't second guess what the audience is going to want. I, I, I have a hard time doing that. As somebody who has your foot in both film and in theater, when you look at, at the reviews that the prom got on stage versus the reviews that the prom got on Netflix, very different response. Um, and I don't, I, I don't know why that is, but I, I do have a theory that I want to run by you. Yeah, which is and and it, this this negates the economics of filmmaking because I all I know that you have to have the talent you had in the movie to get the movie made in the first place. Mm -hmm. But is there something about seeing actors we aren't as familiar with play superstars or play even run of the mill characters on Broadway versus 
seeing big stars that come with their own baggage that then compound what our expectation or even how we define a character might be? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, I, I don't know that again. I have the objectivity to analyze it because I I love the show, uh, and I love the movie, and I love them for very different reasons. And you know, to to you know whether Beth Level creating that role on stage and seeing her perform each and every night, or Brooks Ashmanch gets to see him perform each and every night. These are like the Olympic athletes of the theater right now. Like they just are people that are unbelievable at the craft and what they do. Um, and yet, sitting with Ryan and knowing that in order to make a show called The Prom with the subject matter that it was, and the kind of magic that he brings to his projects of getting people to do things they've never done before, like something like The Prom, so many more people watch The Prom and experience that story because Meryl Streep and Nicole Kidman, and then you have Ariana DeBose and one of her biggest first things that she did. Um, I don't know. I don't. I, I. I don't know. I think there's just a different energy when you enter a theater to go see a musical. I think when you're watching a musical on a TV screen or in a movie theater, you're a more passive. You have a more passive experience to it. So, you're you're right. You're right. You're probably going like you know Meryl Streep as this. You know maybe the math. The math makes it harder just to relax and enjoy it. Whereas if you go to see a show in the theater and it's people that are great at what they do, whether you know them as a star or a Broadway star, you can just really go into the story in a different way. Right. Um, talking about math, um, you know, the prom did not recoup its investment on Broadway. That's obviously a difficult decision when, when the producers get together and figure out this is where we have to say the buck stops here. But what are the considerations that you guys all have? factor into mind when you think well it didn't work here but let's take it on the road yeah um i mean we you know the it that saying it takes a village could not be more true in terms of like the team that comes together to get a show up um and our entire producing team all of our co-producers all of our investors the one thing that i look back and feel really proud of is everyone believed in that show and everyone leaned in when we needed more to keep it going and and everyone sensed what we had on our hands and that we would be in the conversation for the Tonys and for the awards and then that itself would have you know given us another another lease on life so everyone believed in the show first and foremost um the tour is separate is capitalized separately although it does actually pay some money back to the Broadway company um and ultimately because of all the development work that had been done on Broadway, the actual economics of mounting the tour, you know, on paper look really, really favorable. So a lot of people who are the first people who are part of a Broadway production are really excited to be a part of the tour, even if they haven't made their money back on Broadway, because the tour, you know, can be something that delivers in a, at a higher multiple. So, um, you know, I think the show and the movie set the title up pretty well. Um, uh, we've gotten great reviews all over the country. Everywhere we go, people seem to love the show. Um, we've done amazing in some markets. We've done fine in others. I think that's just the the role of the dice of producing any live events right now is that you're going to catch whatever wave you're going to catch, literally, wherever you are. And people have less dollars to go out to live events, and they are more selective. And what you the touring markets are incredible is they have these wonderful developed relationships with their subscribers if you can produce your tour in a way that like you do you do fine even if only the subscribers come then it's worth trying it because then you could actually break into a larger audience and it helps then also the longer term which is schools and professional theaters and and non-professional and then you have that whole life span for the show afterwards then you take a show like Moulin Rouge, um, which we don't have to get into the numbers of what it was capitalized. I know what it was, but let's just say, you know, Julie Taymor's record is going to stand for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, but does the success of that show, do the Tonys allow you to tour that show differently? Because as somebody who's seen the show, you know, it's like I tell people who haven't seen it in New York that you get 90 to 95% of what you get in New York in the tour. 
And there are very few tours about which you could say that, except maybe Lehman Trilogy um, and, and shows that are more self-contained. Moulin Rouge is not, a self, is not an easy show. It is a big, huge experience. And I was pleasantly surprised how much that was like the Broadway production. Thank you. Thank you for saying, I mean, you know, we have the unbelievably gifted geniuses of Alex Timbers and Derek McLean and Catherine Zuber and Sonia Taya and Justin Townsend and Justin, I mean, their team is just amazing. And, you know, we, you know, we were, it was interesting because because of the pandemic, our kind of like rollout of the show around the world got condensed into a very small window. So not only were we reopening Broadway, we opened Australia, London, and the tour all within eight, like just a few months. So we were working on all of those productions at the same time. And I think one of the, the things that we actually realized was that London and Broadway would be the most like each other because they are installations, the theaters are somewhat smaller, and we can deliver a certain kind of experience. The tour in Australia feel more analogous to each other because primarily we're playing much bigger houses, you know, like, so right there, you're going, okay, how do we not just deliver the show that we love, that we made, that when the people who hear about Moulin Rouge, there's an expectation they come with. They think it's going to be, you know, the words that have been applied to our show by others, we now need to deliver those words. It needs to be thrilling and spectacular and beautiful and lush and euphoric and all the words that people use to describe our show. A lot of that, of course, comes from the tremendous performers who open their hearts and souls and sing those incredible songs each night. Um, but the concept is slightly different. And as you know, the, we have a passerelle um, and it's a little bit probably more, you consider it a little more immersive when you're when you're in the Broadway house or in the London house, whereas in Australia and in uh, on our tour, that just the logistics of touring a passerelle like that and the distance of the stage from the first row and the size of the orchestra. So right away, we just went, since we can't duplicate that, how do we give those audiences the same how, punch, emotion, experience, but in a different way? And so there's different things that have been done to do that, but the staging is slightly altered. And I think because everything is within the frame and the frame is really gorgeous and amazing and the lighting and the way we use the elephant and the windmill, people feel, you know, when they walk into the Pantages or when they walk into the Orpheum in San Francisco, they go, wow, I've never seen anything like this. If they haven't seen the Broadway show, that's that's the reaction we're looking for. And hopefully more people like you are going, wow, it's not exactly the same, but it's still pretty spectacular. I think that's what we wanted to hit. Who needs the fireworks ultimately? Right. Exactly. Um, but but I didn't know it was possible to out Baz Baz. Oh, gosh. Well, I, I think it might still be impossible. I mean, have you seen Elvis? Are you a fan of Elvis? Yes. Oh, I love that movie. I did too. I love that movie. I should also tell you that I worked on Moulin Rouge, the film. Did you really? Oh my yeah. God, that's amazing. I produce I produce EPK and creative content, and that was one of my favorite projects I've ever worked on. Were you at Fox at the time, or were you have you been independent the whole time? I've been independent the whole time. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a it, I mean, that movie just I go back to it and go back to it. And of course, it's been a touchstone for us. But you know, Baz himself, Baz and Catherine were amazing you know they call themselves kind of like auntie and uncle baz and Catherine, because they said like whatever you do like make it your own do not put the movie on stage and when we made this it used the music of the moment and we don't want it to feel like a period piece so please take advantage of the last 20 years of song catalog as well and just by having that kind of uh those simple rules from him and then Alex very wisely said, how do we replace the Baz of the movie, the whip pans, the moving cameras, all of that stuff that Baz does? How, what's that vocabulary in the theater? And that theater became kind of the mashup of the very elegant turn of the century looking costumes and scenery of Derek and the like Beyonce concert lighting and choreography of Sonia and Justin. And that became like, okay, here's how we marry the two things together and have it feel of the time, but also of our moment. Fair enough. One change that you guys made in the Broadway show 
Um, and I hope this isn't a spoiler, but the film's been around for a long time. Mm-hmm. But the film opens with letting you know that Satine is going to die. And I'm wondering how artistically that decision was made not to replicate that and why. Um, it, it actually, um, it, it's it's actually the 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 bigger way to say that note is that Satine is the last person in the film to know that she's dying. Everyone else around her, including the audience, knows before she does. She only finds out like in the last moment. So I think one of the big things we wanted to do with the stage version um, is give the character of Satine more agency and and give her more moments where she's making decisions that are are moving the story forward. Um, I think obviously very much classic La Boheme, La Traviata, you know, that's the map of the film and it works beautifully and it's gorgeous. Um, on the stage, I think you need you need characters who are driving the action, who are making mistakes, who are making decisions, and our two leads like do that. And so really it was a conversation with John Logan and Justin and Alex and all of us about how do we make Satine like a true protagonist? And by giving her the knowledge, it gives her the knowledge also to when she shares it with others. The audience still finds out earlier than anybody else does. And then what does she do about it? And what she does about it, I think, is quite beautiful and heartbreaking, which is she still wants to go on. She still wants to do Christian's music. She still wants to make his music immortal. So all of that, I think, leans into the emotion, I think, that the show has, which is for different reasons than the emotion that the film has. I will tell you, however, that when I when I saw the show a second time in Los Angeles, the people in front of me were absolutely shocked that she died. They had they did not see it coming. They went, oh no, like they did not know. I don't know where they were during the show, but mm. but you know they didn't they didn't get that that was that was going to be her fate. So I you know I guess some people get it more than others. But Moulin Rouge falls into into a category that I like to think of is is doomed love stories. Because if we think of the dramatic love stories that tell that stand the test of time, going back to Romeo and Juliet, you know, or Gone with the Wind, Casablanca, Wuthering Heights. I mean, I could go down a huge Star road. is Born, A Star is Born. Star is Born, Titanic, for that matter. Yeah. We like we tend to be attracted to dramatic stories where the couple doesn't end up together for some reason. Why mm-hmm. do you think that is? I mean, it, you know, it's, you know, a tale as old as time, right? That's part of it. And I, I'm always, I, I'm always fascinated by that as well. I, I mean, I, I think, I think what people are really attracted to is the power of like that, you know, our, our Christian says it, Do you remember the first time you ever fell in love, you know, hopeless love, romantic love, dangerous love, all the kinds of loves we've always had. And I think Moulin Rouge actually is about all the kinds of loves that happen between people. Losing love, losing someone you love is also part of the canon of our experiences of love in our life. And that yet what Moulin Rouge is ultimately about is about the hope and the optimism and the fact that you carry that with you forever. So I do I do think there's like a hopeful optimism to Moulin Rouge, even though our our main character doesn't, you know, make it out of the story. Um, it's the other main character is transformed by that forever and holds that in his heart. Right. I want to conclude by asking about something that Hal Prince said, probably, you know, the greatest Broadway producer in my lifetime anyway. And he said, the idea is to work and to experiment. Some things will be creatively successful. Some things will succeed at the box office. And some things will only, which is the biggest only, teach you things that see the future. And they're probably as valuable as any of your successes. What have the prom in Moulin Rouge taught you? Um... In, in very different ways, both of them have taught me to follow my heart and my gut um, and and also to choose to work with amazing and incredible people that will challenge you, will be amazing partners, will be incredible collaborators, will push you in every single way. So, you know, I very much live by the school of like work with a lot of people who, you know, if you're going to go play tennis, play with people who are way better than you are. And I think on both the prom and Moulin Rouge, the teammates, the collaborators were, are exceptional people. And I really believed in both of those, 
projects. Like I believed in the prom. I didn't know it was going to be commercial. I believed in Moulin Rouge, even though I think in retrospect, I was like, oh, Moulin Rouge, it was just a layup. You know, it was as hard for us to raise the money for Moulin Rouge as it was to raise the money for the prom. Everyone was like, oh, really? Moulin Rouge? The creative team, you know, at the time had not had their big, great successes that they've had since then. So ultimately what it came down to was like, do I believe in this material and do I believe in these people? And can I see myself spending the next five or 10 years of my life caring about this? And if the answer to all three of that is like, yes, then go for it. 